All right, so first by way of announcement, um, final projects you may have seen on Slack, um, they, the latest that Learning Suite now lets you uh, have an assignment due is the last day of classes before exams. And so um, I told you that the final project would be due the last day of exams and that will remain the same, uh, but just email it to my, uh, my email address for this class, I posted it on Slack and, um, yeah, so if, if you finish it before before the due date on Learning Suite, then you can turn it in via Learning Suite. But if not, then you can email it to me and there will be no uh, late points taken off. It'll be due at 11.59 p.m. on December 16th. Okay, any questions on that? All right, any questions? So we, I, I had a couple of questions come up about what counts for your final project. Um, so there, there were some questions about like, does time when the network is training count? And the answer is kind of. Um, if you set your network to off to train for 20 hours and then uh, and you know go to bed and get get to a, get back to it at 4 p.m. the next day, uh, unfortunately that that does not count. Not those 20 hours do not count towards your final project. Um, the idea is that you're spending like about that you're spending at least 20 hours actively iterating and analyzing and improving your, your network. Uh, this could involve coding up experiments. This could involve uh, coding up evaluation metrics to evaluate how your model is performing, um, coding up variations on that. But the idea is that, yeah, so in general, like time training the model doesn't count per se. Um, if, if you're waiting like 15 or 20 minutes just for like debugging um, and making sure that things are training correctly, that you can you can count that, but um, yeah, no like counting long swaths of of training time for your final project if that makes sense. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so today we are looking at some of the largest scale um, deep learning projects that have been tackled in in the last decade or so, and these are some challenges that have gotten a lot of hype and. Um, an enormous amount of engineering resources were poured into them. Um, today's lecture is more about engineering than it is about theory, to be honest. It's, it's, it's about how do you scale up and what are some challenges that arise in that scenario. And so we're gonna be looking at large scale, deep reinforcement learning. We're gonna be looking at two examples. One is the um, OpenAI 5 uh, model, for playing Dota 2, and the other is AlphaStar, the, the model created by the company DeepMind to play StarCraft. So um, both of these are real-time strategy games, which if you're not familiar, they're games, uh, video games where um, you are taking actions in continuous time, it's not turn-based, and um, yeah, you're competing against an opponent who is also taking actions in continuous time. So there, there, are, some, there are some challenges with this type of problem. Um, number one, most of these games are designed to be very well balanced, such that there is no optimal strategy and there is a good counter to every other strategy. Um, imperfect information. Um, so uh, the, these games have what's called a fog of war covering the map, and so you need uh, scouting to gather information, um, long-term planning. Lo I'm sure you saw this in your uh, reinforcement learning labs, even in these very simple kind of toy examples that we did, like the cart pole um, problem. Um, you, you saw the, these, uh, the difficulty of um, taking actions to do well at future time steps. Um, yeah, again, also actions are taken in a continuous time space and players are acting at the same time and the state is always changing, uh, not always based on your own actions. And then a large state space and action space. So um, you have a huge map to, to take in and internalize and figure out what is signal and what is noise, uh, multiple unit types, lots of different abilities. And these are challenges that kind of apply to both of these, both of these games. Okay, so OpenAI 5, um, the, the task is Dota 2. So Dota 2 is a 
uh, online battle arena game where you are um, on a team of five what are called champions as well, and you're playing against another team of five champions. Um, you're playing on a map that has certain buildings and kind of your own, your own base and your opponent's base. And yeah, so this is an example of a champion in Dota 2. You can also have other, what are called support units. Um, we're actually, so to be honest, I don't play Dota 2. This is, this is just me br briefly reading up on it before this, this lecture. I'm not sure if these are champions or if, if these are side units. Does anyone know? Dota players? Okay, so these, these might be the champions themselves. Okay. So you're, again, you're playing five on five. So um, there are 117 available heroes and basically their approach is to take the PPO algorithm that you all know you, with, where you have an action network and a value network or, and, or a policy network and a, and a value network. And um, they basically just scale it up. So nothing too crazy. Um, and then they also incorporate self-play. So kind of an, an evolutionary uh, type You've heard about evolutionary algorithms, almost like an evolutionary algorithm uh, approach where its opponents are previous versions of itself and it has to, has to, comp to compete against them. And yeah, so uh, it plays against the current version 80% of the time and a previous version of itself 20% of the time. Any idea, any thoughts on why it might be important to train against previous versions of yourself with this type of problem? Yeah, Spencer. I think the main idea is that it ensures that your um, neural network doesn't forget previous strategies or um, old things that it learned previously. Exactly. Yeah. So a uh, significant difficulty or challenge with reinforcement learning is what's called catastrophic forgetting, where you learn a really good strategy and then you forget it and are unable to learn it again. And so uh, a real challenge of reinforcement learning is what we would call continual learning, which is trying to overcome catastrophic forgetting by building on previous experience instead of moving on from, from previous experience. So um, the architecture has five identical copies of the same architecture. Um, each of them receive basically the same inputs containing the state of the map. Um, as far as the, the state that it receives as input, instead of re receiving screenshots, which is what a human would use, uh, the state is approximated in various data arrays uh, containing relevant information about the game. Um, yeah, and then as far as output, um, you there is a, a basically a categor categorical distribution over actions that it chooses, as well as other, other heads that parameterize that action, whether it's, and th those could be like continuous values um, based, based on intensity or um, direction or other things like that. Um, are, are you familiar with this, tech, this term head when it comes to, um, when it comes to, to deep learning? It's, it's kind of a colloquial, colloquialism that basically just means a linear layer at the end of your network. And so um, the network basically, you, could think, you can think of most neural networks as giant representational learners that, whose job is to summarize the input into one perfect vector that contains the perfect representation of the input. And then uh, different, pet, uh, well, in most of the cases in this class, we've only had one what we would call a projection head, where we're projecting into some action space or value function or uh, classification distribution or something like that. Uh, but it's common when you have a network that you want to do multiple things to have multiple heads. So um, we'll see that um, this model has one head, one projection head, one linear, linear layer for, to uh, predict which action to take, another one to predict to parameterize the action and then another head to um, predict the value function. Um, 
And so basically everything is shared except those different projection heads. Does that make kind of make sense? Okay. So yeah, architecture, um, five identical copies of the five agent. Um, it's a one layer, uh, 1024 unit LSTM. So again, like we're not doing anything groundbreaking here as far as neural network architectures, like LSTMs were built, were, were first designed in the early nineties. So um, this is really, the story here is not about innovation in architectures, but more about scaling. So this is the architecture um, and they make it look a lot more complicated than I think it needs to be. Basically all of these yellow boxes are descriptions of different input features. Um, so this says nearby terrain, eight by eight grid of height, traversability, creep op occupancy for each hero and team. Uh, allied and enemy glyph cooldown in night, time until creep wave, etc. And so basically all of these uh, state elements are getting pre-processed in some way and eventually be, this this little purple uh, rectangle is the LSTM and basically all of those those input features get concatenated and passed through an LSTM which predicts um, each of the actions and the parameterization of those actions um, yeah as far as ability to coordinate between team members. There's not explicit communication. Um, they do have a team spirit hyperparameter, which uh, basically the amount of, controls the amount at, by which each, care, each agent is working towards the other agent's reward functions. Um, yeah, so I guess with this in mind, uh, do you think it's, fair to pit this agent against a human? Do you think the, uh, like the approach used by the OpenAI 5 uh, team, yeah, is fair? Good question. So based off the article, I think what they ended up settling on was uh, they made sure that it had the same interface with the game that human participants had. So like it had to actually have like a camera interface pointed at the screen instead of directly taking information like from the game. And I think they even added like a delay. So that was more on par with like human reflexes. And I think I think because of that, it's fair. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think that that's. So I actually, I didn't read the article. Um, I wasn't aware that these were features extracted just from looking at the screen. Um, yeah, it, it does kind of feel to me a little bit unfair in that you, it wasn't getting pixel values as input um, and rather a simplified input um, just because yeah, humans have to uh, deal with a, a much larger, I would say like, state space than the agent. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's an interest, interesting thought. Um, and yeah, I think that the time delay is, is very important as well. Um, okay, so this is how they did it. Um, so basically they had uh, the model itself and they did offline learning. So they would have rollout workers, which if you remember, a rollout is a run through the environment, which uh, where the current version of the model would play against different versions of itself and previous versions. Um, then um, these rollouts would be simultaneously, um, an optimizer would be sampling from these rollouts, computing, uh, computing loss, loss functions and uh, gradients and updating the model parameters. And basically uh, all of these were running simultaneously. So while we're running ro rollouts for the current uh, model parameters, we are training on previous rollouts. Um, yeah.
So another um, difficulty that they had to deal with uh, in training this is that um, if you've ever played online games, uh, they are not necessarily stable. Stable. The, the developers are, are always making game patches, whether they are to balance the competition or introduce new mechanics, um, et cetera. And so this uh, training process happened over the process of 10 months in the which course there were several uh, game updates that were made. And so um, they, yeah, OpenAI spent millions of dollars to train this model. And so they didn't want to have to retrain from scratch every time. And so they developed some to a suite of tools to basically update their model for new uh, actions. And um, they, they called this surgery. So uh, basically a, 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 a suite of tools to um, basically maintain the performance of the current version of the model while introducing new abilities. Um, so in the, in, the, in the simplest case where the action space doesn't change, maybe just there are some reward, some some actions that get buffed or whatever, we just uh, take the previous version of the model parameters as our current version and, and continue training. Um, the others, yeah, involved having to actually change the action space and things like that. So this is a graph of um, basically the difference between performing surgery and um, what would happen if you did not have to perform surgery. So this is the this is training the network. Um, this is so the top is how things actually happened, um, where the model was basically able to, to continually improve as the uh, yeah as as the game was updated. Uh, on the bottom is hypothetically how long it would take to, to retrain the model with each. Uh, each time that it was updated. And so each of these vertical gray bars represents retraining the model from scratch due to an update in the game. So this, this be became a pretty important thing. Can you think of uh, how, like from an, an engineering perspective, how th these kinds of approaches might be uh, important in the real world if, if you are applying deep learning in your job? Yes, Spencer? Yeah, if I'm working on Tesla's self-driving system, I don't want to have to like completely retrain the model every time I like deal with, uh, I don't know, implement a program that deals with um, cats crossing the street. Like that would be ridiculous. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, especially with very large scale, hard to train models. Can you think of any ways that you might, uh, yeah, let, let's say that, uh, you have uh, a trained model, a trained self-driving car model that takes as input, uh, we'll just say uh, an, a video frame or a series of video frames of the road, and you want to be able to, you want to teach it to uh, handle this new situation, and then pr it predicts an action space of uh, different, different actions, whether that's turning the wheel or accelerating or decelerating. Um, how, any ideas for how you might, uh, tra yeah, train it on this new task with while trying to maintain the previous performance? Or you make it even harder. Uh, let's say uh, your your Tesla gets a new uh, ni nitro feature and that gives you extra acceleration so you have an extra action an extra action in your action space how, how would you handle that without without retraining from scratch it's not a rhetorical not a rhetorical question i'm i'm challenging you guys to think here these are questions that you might run into yeah, Max, what do you think? I mean, this might not work at all, but you could have like maybe if, say, you're breaking up your huge model into a bunch of little models. And like for the example with um, having like a cat come into the road and 
you know, your model previously wasn't trained to recognize cats. You could like hopefully train your model to recognize objects that like it doesn't have a classification for. And then hopefully you can reuse those weights and maybe retrain less, if that makes sense. Totally. So yeah, um, there's an interesting, so this idea of training your network to deal with things that it's never seen before um, is actually an approach that we saw used in GPT-3 where uh, we saw um, they were able to prompt, basically prompt their model with training uh, with input output pairs of their of their training data. And basically uh, we call this few shot learning or one shot learning. Um, and yeah, I think that that's a, a very promising way of dealing with uh, new information. You know, you provide a couple of, you train a network that given a couple of examples is able to uh, generalize on those examples, kind of a, a meta learning thing. I um, mean, yeah, pr prompt engineering in general is uh, an, a very active area of research because of the power of, you know, you take a trained network and you're able to update it and um, with no further training are able to handle new types of inputs. Yes, and those are, yeah, good ideas. Any other thoughts? How about dealing with, um, dealing with an added action in your action space? For OpenAI, we have the LSTM block that feeds into a, a couple of um, linear layers. I would freeze the LSTM block, but then either retrain the uh, the uh, linear layers or potentially add on like a sixth linear layer to pull out what to do with that new action. Yeah, interesting. So I think I think the linear layers they map to action spaces, and so you would you would. I'm not sure that adding a linear layer would work unless you were adding a whole another type of action. Uh, I, that in that case, yeah, I think that's I think that's a great idea of just fine tuning that that single linear layer. Um, yeah, just just kind of thinking uh, thinking about this off, off the top of my head. Uh, you know, linear layers they um, map if we have an input of size 100 and an output of size 50, and we want to have an output of size 51. Um, that's going to be a single row in our linear layer. And so you could create a new linear layer that's initialized with the first 50 rows being the first 50 rows of the previous layer, and then initialize that uh, new action space to, um, or yeah, that, that new layer to some, uh, or that, that last row to some maybe Gaussian, or we could do like he initialization or something like that. Um, and yeah, that, that would be a way that we could possibly preserve um, preserve everything that we've learned about the other actions while adding another action. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, these are some things that they observed about this agent. Um, so um, number one, it re repeated. So on this map, I don't know if you can see, but there are different what are called lanes or places you can travel. Um, paths that you can travel on. And so it often would sacrifice its own safe lane um, in exchange for controlling the enemy's safe lane, forcing the fight onto the side that is harder for the opponent to defend. Um, and apparently this is a strategy that has emerged in the professional scene in the last few years and is now cons considered to be um, the best tactic. Um, and prof professional players have commented that it took them years and years of play to, to figure out the strategy. Um, yeah, other things that they observed, um, it was very aggressive. So it pushed transitions from early to mid game faster. So um, it would set up these surround, this, this apparently this is called a, a gank where you try to surround your opponent um, and force a fight. Um, so they, they, the, the open AI agent did that um, and also, yeah, quickly grouping up to take down opponent towers before opponents could defend them. Um, yeah, and then also deviating from current current play style in some other some other areas where um, they gave support heroes 
uh, more early experience in, in gold, uh, which I guess allowed them to peak sooner um, in, with their non-support heroes. Yeah, what's your question? That's that's a really interesting perspective. Yeah, I don't know exactly how they set up their rewards their reward signal, but that's that's very possible. That yeah, the the aggression could be a result of um, it being easier to focus on it, prioritizing early rewards and maybe having a, a gamma that's a little too high. But apparent or I mean too high, obviously it works. So yeah, that, that's a a really interesting thought. Yeah. So. Uh, the spoiler alert is that um, they beat the world champion Dota, Dota 2 team in back-to-back -back, back -back games. Um, and we're going to take a look to see how that happened. This is, and this is, so this is the second game. Uh, so this is the beginning where they are drafting teams. Taking a lot of heavy harass here from this duo lane. Thompson does have backups. Both No Tail and Jerax 
blitzing open AI far as Jarrett's more focused the fighter. Dev comes in with the TP. They have surrounded the Sven. Open AI trying to run their ground at this Sven, but he's stuck in the trees. They'll lose the Sven open AI. Viper's still good to fight, and they've also now rotated in the gyrocopter. Step put on the front lines. Cycle will not keep him alive, or will it? He gets a second one out. It's a good amount of a sustain, but surely not enough, as the poison will be there from the fight. Now, Open AI are getting both of the kills. Open AI is it. They're not going to make mistakes. They're not going to throw away this speech. You have to go out play them. You have to outmaneuver them. The Vitray OG there is struggling to certainly do that. But they'll lose pops and set trying to move in. But the Crystal Maiden with that massive amount of damage coming from the ultimate to the ground. Two dead. All right. So anything you notice in, I mean, yeah, whether you're a Dota player or not, um, in the behavior of. Oh, trying to get out of this. Bit of technical difficulties here. All right. Okay, yeah, did you notice? I mean, I personally do not play Dota 2. Uh, so out, out of curiosity, do we have any, any Dota players here? Not a single one. All too busy designing neural networks. Um, yeah, not knowing necessarily about this game though, did, did you notice anything about the AI behavior that seemed like interesting to you or, yeah? I don't play Dota, but I've played a few real-time strategy games and one of the big things you have to master is micromanagement. And it was clearly able to maneuver all of its different pawns very efficiently in one moment, wheezing out every last bit of damage before retreating him. And so that uh, that would create a lot of problems for me if I was trying to play against it. Totally. Yeah, interesting. So the commentary helped quite a bit for me to notice this, but I noticed that like it would take like high risk um, approaches to like get kills or like make like movements and probably it's due to the reward system. But there are certain things where it's like, oh, it's just gonna blow past the tower to, and just like take a bunch of damage in order to secure like this kill. Or I noticed it took like really high risk strategies that usually seem to like almost always pay off, at least the ones that like we were seeing. And I thought that was interesting. I bet it probably had to do with like, maybe like the reward system. But yeah, I just thought it was interesting that it took like high risk moves, like, and put his players at risk in order to like achieve objectives. Totally, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I noticed the same where you, you would see it get down to like 30 HP or whatever, um, but, but yeah, but, but it would like never die. And so it was, it was very good at, um, and like almost every time you saw it go after someone, it would kill the hero, the, the opposing hero, right? It rarely left opposing heroes with any HP, right? Um, yeah. So different, diff definitely different risk assessment strategies. Like I know in the games that I've played, when I get to, get to low HP, I start getting really nervous and not taking taking a lot of risks. Um, but we saw even in low HP scenarios, it would um, sometimes. Yeah, take the, those big risks. Yeah, what do you think, Max? Yeah, just a brief comment off of that. Like, it's interesting that maybe the computer, I mean, it never died, but it was taking all these high risk, risk strategies. But like, if you're a team of five and you're one of the players and you're about to die, like, I feel like that would be a really big motivation just as an individual player. Like, oh, I don't get to play anymore, you know, or I'm not going to help my team. But because the open AI five, is controlling all of the players. I feel like it was able to like 
I don't know if it needed to sacrifice someone, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. Like it kind of saw a bigger picture strategy. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, the, the one one thing that it looked like there was a little failing is where uh, it looked like one of the human players was able to kind of like hide behind a tree. Did you notice that? And it was able to survive in that way. So yeah, the AI isn't perfect, but yeah, great great micro. So also something to know about in real time real time strategy strategy is there's micro strategy, which is basically how you control individual units, um, and then there's macro strategy, which is like more longer term planning. Um, and yeah, uh, it seems like really where this agent excels in, is in the micro strategy. Another interesting thing to note is that like, while this AI performs really well with other AI, they did a study where they paired AI, these AIs with humans, they performed very poorly. So they have like some sort of interconnect dependencies. Interesting, yeah. So they're, they kind of rely on, because they were trained with a self-play uh, approach, they didn't cooperate well with humans. Maybe some, some lessons to learn there in the way that we, we try to train our AGI. Maybe it's a good thing to to train our AI to have to commute to to cooperate with humans, um, and not only with other AIs. Okay, anything else on Dota before we move to StarCraft and Alpha Star? Okay, so StarCraft um, is pretty different from Dota in that rather than controlling uh, one main hero and maybe a couple of subunits, you are controlling an entire army with potentially hund hundreds of units. Um, there are three factions that you can choose, um, Terran, Zerg, and Protoss. Um, Alpha Star was only trained to play as Protoss, but was trained to play against any faction. Yeah, these are some screenshots from the game. Um, yeah, so it took as input, um, features from the game interface, game stats, mini map, unit types, positions, and output, uh, an action space, uh, as well as a value function. And so, yeah, by way of comparison to like other games that reinforcement learning has been used on, um, I think chess, you can narrow the action space to six, six different actions that you choose a categorical distribution across. There are 10 to the 26th actions available uh, at each moment in StarCraft. And Alpha Star was limited on its APM or actions per minute to match human players. So, um, yeah, this is the architecture. Takes as inputs uh, baseline features, scalar features, entities, and minimap, um, and has a uh, core embedding layer, um, and then a value network projection projection head and an action type projection head, as well as um, some delay and queuing functions to make it more realistic. This is a video of it playing. So yeah, AlphaStar was trained a little bit differently from uh, the Dota 5 model. It was trained initially using imitation learning. So rather than being trained with a traditional reinforcement learning objective to maximize reward, it was basically just trained to copy a human. Um, and so with that, AlphaStar was able to reach about the 84th percentile of human performance. And then from, from there, um, they, after the imitation learning phase, they then went into a multi-agent RL phase where various Alpha Star agents played against each other, the self-play thing that we saw with the, alpha, with the OpenAI 5 model. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Um, 
so the, the point is that why, if you're just trained on imitation learning, why are you hitting the 84th percentile instead of the 50th percentile? What, what do you guys think? More extensively weight the data from better players. That, that, that could be what they did. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I have a hypothesis of why it might be the case, even, even if they did weight them the same. Yeah, so I think it could like learn all the best strategies versus just like, I mean, you're probably going to like weigh like the players who win and you can just train it on like really high professional level like data. So when it plays against like your average person, it's not used, like the average person isn't used to probably playing like a professional level person. Interesting. So yes, yeah, a similar point. Um, interesting yeah so that it was limited in, in its actions per minute um yeah we'll we'll take one thought and then i'll tell you what i think it is well one thing to note is in a game like this i think i've played a game similar to starcraft and um you're controlling like sometimes hundreds of units which for a human can be hard to control and it depends on how well you play the strategy. Like I played a game similar and there are a couple of different strategies and yes, technically not one was the best, but you had a measure of how well you did that strategy. Yeah, so again though, we are, we're, we're, not, we're not optimizing reward. We're just optimizing copying the AI. My hypothesis for why even trained on the the actions of all players that it could outperform 84 84% of players is because there are lots of strategies that don't work and there are only a few strategies that do work and so um basically the the strategies that do work were uh performed more off showed up more often in the training set and the strategies that didn't work were basically kind of a random scattering of strategies. And so, and so there was a strong signal to, to noise ratio of uh, functional strategies versus non-functional strategies. And so it ended up being biased towards the functional strategies, but that's, that's just my thought. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, these are just some results. Um, I wanna get where we can watch it play for a little bit. This video is honestly really interesting. Um, we so we're gonna watch the end of the end of this game and the commentary of the player. Um, this is not something we see very often. The clock is coming in from no four angles as well. Four is laying at this point all the time. This is pretty wow. insane. So wow. much. <laughs> that, yeah. that is just unbelievable. Like me. Means so many more than this game. I can't even. This is like literally pure soccer. In the unit that the immortal looks down. It's so surprising. And GG is, is called the hot there. Out a wonderful being wrong. Didn't work. So I was very, very disappointed from this game because I thought had everything that I needed. I could have had portals, perfect spaces, the batteries, decent doctors, but I, they could have been better. I had only class, a very, very late charge. But like, portal versus late stalker? No, it's not. It's just and even better, that's not going to be my turn to talk with that, but I'm sure you might know. The Alpha Alpha was playing very well at the beginning, but the Alpha Alpha Alpha, the better it was for me, and that's in the middle of the night. The right side, the bottom side, like I can't see everything, right? So I was very, very surprised the way that the Alpha was and 
feeling into my eye because my eye is that spread activation is not my own. So interesting, interesting comments. I, I, I thought there from, from Mana. Um, I'll just tell you, point out my my in, my my view on this. I think like the actions per minute per limit per minute limitation was perhaps not enough because there are there are limitations to a human's ability to play the game beyond actions per minute. Awareness of being able to look multiple places at the same time that the that the that Alpha Star has that a human just doesn't have, and to be able to rotate between actions in different places on the map uh, much faster. 